Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Hello again and welcome to the Access Oasis D Accuracy Webinar Series. This is part three of four and I'm Jennifer Gibson Osborne, your trainer for today. I'm a registered nurse and I am Oasis Encoding certified and have been here with Access for over six and a half years and have been in the home health industry for 25 plus years. Uh, we are transitioning, as we well know, in January of 2019 to a new OASIS data set called OASIS D. We've already covered in parts one and two some of the background information regarding OASIS, how it's tied to the conditions of participation, and then we've gone over the general rules and conventions per CMS of how to fill out the OASIS. So in our third and fourth parts of the series, we're going to get into the actual changed items with OASIS D and we're going to begin that right now. As we've said in prior sessions, the slides here that you see are just meant to be cue points uh, and not everything that I say will be in the handouts or slides that you are privy to. Also just a side note, um, as information changes going forward with CMS, just keep in mind that at the time of this recording, the information is current. However, CMS does change regulations, especially with OASIS D and new implementation. Uh, we'll get quarterly updates, so things might be clarified or changed. So just keep that in mind as you refer back to these in the future. Our objectives for this OASIS Accuracy Seminar are to understand the official OASIS D guidelines and conventions, to learn the new and modified OASIS D items, to understand OASIS D implications in quality and payment and outcomes measurement. Uh, we're going to learn some clinical tips for obtaining accurate OASIS D data. And then we're going to apply some item-specific guidance to some scenarios in these last two sessions so that we get some practice. So we're going to look now at the OASIS D new item guidance for the GG100 prior functioning item for the GG110 prior device use question and then GG130 self care. There are three additional items that will be covered in session four, but due to the length and trying to keep these uh, about an hour or less long, we are only going to cover GG100, 110, and 130 in session three. The quality of data output is only as good as data input. And I say that just to remind us that if we're going to get an accurate assessment, we need to apply the rules that we've learned in part two of the series, the guidelines and conventions, and also understand item specific guidance. And that's what we're going to go over with these new questions. CMS recommends agencies develop internal systems for monitoring data accuracy in addition to data checking features incorporated into CMS supplied data entry software and or other data entry systems. What that means is that, you know, you shouldn't rely only on your OASIS export rejections and warnings, nor your OASIS scrubbers, uh, but really that you should have an internal system for monitoring data accuracy. So in your QAPI program or chart reviews, you should be comparing OASIS data with other information in the chart and that it makes sense. Information related to the correction of erroneous OASIS data can be found in Appendix B of the OASIS D Guidance Manual. There is a specific process if you need to change something on the OASIS. All right, so let's get right into uh, GG100. And for some of these items, they are so long, they take up on a printed page, a page and a half to two pages. So for that reason, it's best if you pause the presentation and if you don't already have a copy get a copy of the items that we're looking at in printed form from your OASIS D manual so that you can reference them as we go forward and look at the scenarios and such because they just won't all fit on a PowerPoint page. Um, with GG100 this is a prior functioning item for everyday activities. It says to indicate the patient's usual ability with everyday activities prior to the current exacerbation, illness, or injury. Now, what does that mean? First of all, we've got this underlined in red because the timeline is different than the timeline that we learned in the earlier session. 
as we learned in session two, guidelines and conventions generally say, unless the OASIS item tells you differently, the timeline that you're looking at is the day of the assessment. And the day of the assessment is the time you're in the home plus the prior 24 hours. For GG100, the time period we're looking at is different. We're looking at what the patient was able to do prior to this current illness, exacerbation, or injury that sent them to home health. We further see in the descriptor that we're to indicate the patient's usual ability. So what they were able to do 50% or greater of the time prior to this current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Now, you're going to see on the left-hand side, we've got the coding key. And as we talked about in session two earlier, coding is not talking about diagnosis coding here. That's what they mean when they are saying answering the question, basically. So we're going to answer the column and the rows on the right-hand side of this question, A, B, C, and D, using code number three, a number two, a number one, a number eight, or an unknown, number nine. And what we're looking at particularly with this item is self-care. We're looking at the patient's need for assistance with bathing, dressing, using the toilet, or eating prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Now, because this does not say, for example, we are only looking at these specifically, these tasks with self-care. Part B of this question looks at the patient's indoor mobility or their ambulation, and we're looking to answer using the code with the patient's need for assistance with walking from room to room with or without a device like a cane, crutch, or walker prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. C is stairs, coding the patient's need for assistance with internal or external stairs with or without a device like a cane, crutch, or walker prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And then last, D, we're looking for the functional cognition. This is coding the patient's need for assistance with planning regular tasks such as shopping or remembering to take medication prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Section D or part D of this question, it says such as. So you can factor in other things when you're looking at functional cognition. So it gives you examples such as shopping or remembering to take medication. Some other things you might consider would be whether or not they can balance their checkbook or manage their finances. If they have some dementia and so on, that could be a problem. Or if they need reminders to grab their walker before they get up and start walking around. All of those are things that have to do with functional cognition. And because this question says such as, you can factor in other things. We learned yesterday in session two that when the M items are very specific, you're not to specify other things or consider other things. Versus when they are saying, for example, you can talk about or consider other things in this item. So keep that in mind as you're answering A, B, C, or D on GG100. Now, to answer those, we're going to rank either a 3, 2, 1, 8, or 9. 3 is independent. That means the patient completed the task by him or herself, with or without an assistive device, with no assistance from a helper. Number 2, they needed some help. The patient needed partial assistance from another person to complete the activities. Number one, they're dependent, which means a helper completed the activities for the patient. Number eight is unknown, and number nine is not applicable. So if, for example, they didn't use stairs or they don't have stairs, you wouldn't have to worry about their prior status because they didn't use the stairs, so that would be not applicable, right? So now that we've talked about GG100, we've talked about the timeline, we're talking about prior to this current illness, exacerbation, or injury, and that we're looking at prior functioning, we're looking at coding the patient as a three, independent, number two, needed some help, number one, dependent, eight is unknown, or nine is not applicable, and then we're looking at A, B, C, or D, and again, if you don't have a printed copy of the item, I would advise you to pause the presentation and go and get the new GG and J sections of the OASIS-D so that you can see the item as we did just a moment ago because we're going to go through some scenarios and you might want to refer back to the um, actual GG item itself to help you answer the scenario. Further, for this to be the best use of your time and help you learn, I'd also recommend that you pause and try to answer 
and then continue on because I'm going to give the answer right after the scenario. But try your best to answer these looking at the Oasis items rather than just here sitting and, and letting me give you the information, okay? So Mr. S ambulates with the walker around his home and he uses a stair lift to negotiate the stairs to the second floor where his bedroom is located. With that information, how would you code GG100C? Now GG100C has to do with stairs and we're looking at coding the patient's need for assistance with internal or external stairs with or without a device such as a cane crutch or walker prior to the current illness exacerbation or injury. Now just to know, when it talks about a device such as a cane or a walker, they're not talking about a stair lift, which is kind of confusing, but we'll see in CMS's example and answer, they coded GG100C stairs as not applicable. And the reason is Mr. S is not able to go up and down the stairs. He uses a stair lift instead. So he didn't perform this activity before. And for that reason, that would be a nine not applicable. All right, let's go to the next item. The next item we have in the new OASIS is GG110. GG110 is looking at the prior device use. Now again, prior. Think about your timeline. Is that prior to the day of, in the home? According to the descriptor here, it says indicate devices and aids used by the patient prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And it's a check all that apply item. So if they used all of these, you'd check all of them. Uh, if they didn't use any, you'd check none. Okay, so check all that apply. Did the patient use a manual wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair, and or a scooter? Did they use a mechanical lift, a walker, orthotics, prosthetics, or none of the above? Just some clarification from CMS. A mechanical lift is any device a patient or a caregiver requires for lifting or supporting the patient's body weight. Examples include, but are not limited to, things such as stair lifts, Hoyer lifts, bathtub lifts. Uh, in GG110D, when it talks about walkers, it's talking about all kinds of walkers, including pickup walkers, hemi walkers, rolling walkers, and platform walkers. Now, I didn't know what a pickup walker was. I thought maybe that was the walker that we see our patients use when they have a walker and they just pick it up and start walking around with it. I was wrong. I'm just kind of joking about that. But really, a pickup walker is just a standard walker that doesn't have wheels. Okay, so just to clarify in case you didn't know like I didn't what that is. And then, of course, Z is none of the above. That means if you're going to mark Z, the patient did not use any of the listed devices or aids immediately prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. All right, so let's do a practice scenario with GG110, prior device use. Mrs. M is a bilateral lower extremity amputee and has multiple diagnoses, including diabetes, obesity, and peripheral vascular disease. She's unable to walk, and she did not walk prior to the current episode of care that started due to a pressure ulcer and respiratory infection. She used a motorized wheelchair to mobilize. How would you code GG110? So take out your GG110 item and have a look at it, and look at your scenario, and then let's answer the question. You would code GG110B motorized wheelchair and or scooter. That's what you would check as your answer because Mrs. M used a motorized wheelchair prior to the current illness or injury. Mr. C has bilateral lower extremity neuropathy secondary to his diabetes. Prior to this current episode, he used a cane. Today, he's using a walker. How are you coding GG110? So what did he use prior, and then is that in the list on GG110? When you look at GG110 prior device use, you'll notice that a cane is not a device included as part of the item list on the item. So not all the devices and aids are included. So don't just say it's not there, I'm going to check the walker. In this case, since he used a cane prior to this injury or illness, our answer would be Z, none of the above. All right, so we've had a couple practice scenarios with the first couple of questions. Now we're going to get into some of the longer items 
And for this reason, especially GG130 and GG170, I would advise for sure, if you haven't already, stop and get a, a printed copy of these questions because they are in pieces and parts in the presentation because they're so long they won't all fit onto a PowerPoint slide and you can't see them. So we're looking, first of all, I want you to notice on the left-hand side of the slide that this is one of the items that has different guidelines and different um, selections depending on the version. So this is going to be the start of care, resumption of care version. For GG130 self-care, we're looking at coding the patient's usual performance at start of care, resumption of care for each activity using a six-point scale. If the activity was not attempted at start of care or resumption of care, you code the reason why it was not attempted. Then we also will see in just a moment, there's a second column for our answers. And in the second column, we will code the patient's discharge goal or goals using a six point scale. And the use of codes seven, nine, 10, or eight, eight is permissible to code your discharge goals. Let's break that down. Again, we have to apply the rules we learned in session two. Uh, one of the rules for that is timing. We have to look at what time period we're to assess here. And unlike the prior question that we just went over, GG110, in GG130, we're looking at the patient's usual performance at start or resumption of care. So we're looking at time of assessment being today when I'm in the home and 24 hours prior for each activity in this item. Now the coding, we're looking at safety and quality of performance. And it tells us here in the item if the helper assistance is required because the patient's performance is unsafe or of poor quality, we're to score according to the amount of assistance provided. And it tells us also that activities may be completed with or without an assistive device. Now we have a 654321 grading system here. Six is independent, which means the patient completes the activity by him or herself with no assistance from a helper. To reply with number five, set up or clean up assistance, it means the helper sets up or cleans up, the patient completes the activity, and the helper assists only prior to or following the activity. A four would be supervision or touching assistance. That means the helper provides verbal cues and or touching or steadying and or contact guard assistance as patient completes the activity. Assistance may be provided throughout the activity or it may only be intermittently. For number three, partial moderate assistance, the helper would do less than half the effort. The helper might lift or hold or support the trunk or limbs, but provides less than half the effort total. In order to reply with a number two as an answer, the substantial maximal assistance, the helper would lift or hold the trunk or the limbs and provides more than half the effort for this activity. For a number one dependent reply, the helper does all the effort. The patient does none of the effort to complete the activity or the assistance of two or more helpers is required for that patient to complete the activity. I found a tool on a therapy association website that helps us deduce which answer is proper. So I've included that here. And what you'll see, you might want to start asking yourself, can the client complete the task with no assistance? And that's completing the task with or without an, uh, any kind of adaptive equipment. If the answer is yes, then the patient's independent. If the answer, however, is no, you ask the next question, which is, can the person be left alone to do the task after setup? If the answer to that is yes, then it's a number five, set up or clean up only. If the answer is no, then you go to the next question, which is, does the helper provide only supervision or verbal cues or light touch when the patient is completing the task? If the answer is yes, then that would be a number four, supervision or touching. If the answer is no, you go on to the fourth question. Does the helper provide less than half of the effort to complete the task? If the answer is yes to that, then it's partial or moderate assistance. If the answer is no, you ask the next question. Does the helper provide more than half but less than 100% of the effort to complete the task? If that is answered in the affirmative, then that would be a number two, substantial maximal assistance. However, if that's not the case, you go on down and look, and if either of the either-or scenarios apply, the patient would be dependent. And those either-or scenarios are that either the helper has to do 100% of the task or 
there are two or more helpers needed at any time to complete the task. So I hope that helps you when you're answering your M item. Now we also know that if the activity was not attempted for some reason, we have to code the reason why. Number seven means the patient refused to do the activity. Number nine means it's not applicable. It was not attempted and the patient did not perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And number 10 means it was not attempted due to environmental limitations. For example, there's a lack of equipment or there are weather constraints or the environment's not conducive for you to test that particular thing. Uh, number 88, not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns. That's also a possibility. So now let's look at what we're actually answering. For GG130 self-care, you will see that we're looking on the left-hand column in the start of care, resumption of care version. The first column to the left is your start of care, resumption of care performance. And then the second column to the right is the discharge goal. What is your goal going to be? versus what are they able to do now. And then you've got your rows. Row A is eating, and it's talking about only eating, the ability to use suitable utensils to bring food and or liquid to the mouth and swallow the food and or liquid once the meal is placed before the patient. All right, row B, oral hygiene. This is the ability to use suitable items to clean the teeth. Dentures, if applicable the ability to remove and replace dentures from and to the mouth and manage equipment for soaking and rinsing them. Row C is your toileting hygiene. This is the ability to maintain perineal hygiene, adjust the clothes before and after voiding or having a bowel movement. And if they're managing an ostomy, they're talking about wiping the opening but not managing the equipment. In other words, wiping the stoma, but not necessarily placing the wafer or the bag, okay? Um, then we skip to E. There is no D in this item. E is the showering and bathing of self, including washing, rinsing, and drying self. However, in this item, it excludes washing of the back and hair does not include transferring in and out of the tub or shower. Now I want to point out to you the GG item here, GG130, is a little bit different than our M item that has to do with showering and bathing. Neither of the questions, either the M item or the GG item, considers washing the hair. However, this item excludes washing the back, whereas your M item includes washing the back. So you may have a bit of a discrepancy there if you don't understand the question and what you're actually looking at, uh, you might get that wrong. So make sure you understand which item is including what task and which item is excluding the task. In this case, GG130E is excluding washing of the back. All right, in row F, upper body dressing. This is the ability to dress and undress above the waist, including fasteners if applicable. Row G, lower body dressing, is the ability to dress and undress below the waist, including fasteners, and does not include footwear. Because footwear is H, putting on and taking off footwear. This is the ability to put on and take off socks and shoes and other footwear that is appropriate for safe mobility, including fasteners, if applicable. So for the shoes, we're talking about what's appropriate for safe mobility, not can they get their foot in those grippy socks or can they get their foot in those little scuff house shoes that are not appropriate for ambulating in the home. We're talking about whatever footwear would be appropriate in the home. If they need to be wearing supportive high top sneakers, that's what we're assessing. If it would be appropriate for them to be wearing like SAS shoes or whatever else, that's what we are assessing here for their performance uh, under part one or column one. We're looking at what the patient is able to do at the time of assessment, which is when I'm in the home and 24 hours prior. And then two is the discharge goal. All right, you're going to notice at GG130 self-care on follow-up version, we have the same coding 654321. We still have the same coding if the activity was not attempted, the 7, 9, 10, or 8, 8. But you'll notice on the follow-up version, you only have to answer eating, oral hygiene, toileting hygiene. 
And then at discharge, you notice that we're looking at only one column. What are they able to do at discharge? And then you have all the options again, eating, oral hygiene, toileting, shower, bathing self, upper body dressing, lower body dressing, and then footwear. So just again, that's to point out that the different versions, different timelines will have different versions of this item. So when we're looking at the performance assessment for GG130, we're trying to identify the patient's ability to perform the listed self-care activities and then the discharge goals. Now, licensed clinicians may assess the patient's performance based on direct observation, which is preferred, as well as reports from the patient, the clinicians, care staff, and or family. So this will likely be a blended type of question. You can see what you observe in the home, but you're also going to have to ask about what was going on in the hours before you arrived uh, so that you can get their usual performance during the time period. Now, when possible, CMS invites a multidisciplinary approach to the patient assessment for GG130. This is where the one clinician rule clarification and expansion comes into play that we learned in sessions one and two. So make sure you understand exactly what that is and that you have policies when you're doing a multidisciplinary approach. But CMS not only allows it, but in this case, they invite us to do a multidisciplinary approach to assessing the patient's performance of these items. Continued guidance from CMS on this item tells us that patients should be allowed to perform activities as independently as possible as long as they're safe. If the helper assistance is required because patient's performance is unsafe or of poor quality, then you're going to score according to the amount of assistance provided. And activities can be completed with or without assistive device. The use of the assistive device or devices to complete an activity should not affect coding of the activity. We also see that we're told to code the patient's functional status based on a functional assessment that occurs at or soon after the patient's start of care or resumption of care. The start of care, resumption of care function scores are to reflect the patient's start of care, resumption of care baseline status and are to be based on observation of activities to the extent possible. When possible, the assessment should occur prior to the start of therapy services to capture the patient's true baseline status. This is because therapy interventions can affect the patient's functional status. A patient's functional ability can be impacted by the environment or situations encountered in the home, and we certainly see this as home health clinicians. Observing the patient in different locations and circumstances within the home is important for a comprehensive understanding of the patient's functional status. Let me pause right there. CMS is basically telling us, don't think that you can just sit in one place in the home and interview the patient or just have them walk around the little general area where you're doing your assessment. They want us to get the patient throughout the home. They want us to see what the patient's functional ability is throughout the parts of the home that they use, not just where you are at the time that you're in the home. So we need to get that patient up and around, and as we talked about in earlier sessions, do so in a way that they're not put on the spot. So maybe you're thinking about weighing the patient. You might take the scales to the bathroom and explain to the patient that the scales work best on an even, flat surface, and the bathroom usually has the most even, flat surface, perhaps. And so we're going to take the scales back there and weigh. And then you can walk the patient around to the bathroom and have them weigh. Or you might talk with the patient about you wanted to see where their clothing is located and whether or not they can get to that. So you're walking into the bedroom and such. The key for an accurate assessment is moving the patient throughout the different parts of their home and seeing what their environment looks like and then uh, doing so without putting them on the spot. Now, CMS also tells us if the patient's ability varies during the assessment time frame, we are to record their usual ability to perform each activity. Don't record the patient's best performance and don't record the patient's worst performance, but what is their usual performance? In other words, what's true 50% of the assessment time frame? Remember, your assessment time frame is the maximum number of days within which to complete the comprehensive assessment. Their usual performance ability is 50% of the time during that assessment time frame. 
All right, then we find out about the discharge goals column. We don't have to put an answer in all of those discharge goals sections um, as far as, you know, what the patient will do. What they're telling us here is for the Home Health Quality Reporting Program, a minimum of one self-care or mobility goal must be coded. However, you may choose to complete more than one self-care or mobility discharge goal. Use of the activity not attempted codes, which are the 7, 9, 10, or 8, 8, is permissible when you code discharge goals. Use of a dash is permissible for any remaining self-care or mobility goals that were not coded. So in other words, maybe the patient has never been able to put on or take off his or her footwear independently and safely. And you know that by discharge, that's not going to be something that they can do. So you would mark that as either not applicable or not tested or whatever you want to do. But you wouldn't have to put a goal in that that the patient's going to do, do that with moderate assistance or max assistance or whatever, okay? Your discharge goals may be coded the same as the start of care or resumption of care performance. They might be coded higher than that start or resumption performance, or they may be coded lower than the start of care or resumption of care performance. If the start or rock performance of an activity was coded using one of the activities not attempted codes, so maybe you didn't have the patient perform that at start or resumption, you could still put a discharge goal in using the six-point scale if you expect that patient will be able to perform the activity by discharge. So who can actually establish the discharge goal? Does that have to be the doctor or the patient or what? According to the guidance we see for GG130, it tells us licensed clinicians can establish a patient's discharge goal or goals at the time of start of care or resumption of care based on the patient's prior medical condition the start or rock assessment, self-care and mobility status, discussions with the patient and the family, professional judgment, the profession's practice standards, expected treatments, patient's motivation to improve, anticipated length of stay, and the discharge plan. Goals should be established as part of the patient's care plan. So what are they telling us here? Basically, they're telling us to use the best judgment with the information that you can gather and that you should not only answer GG130 goals, but those goals should be translated as part of the care plan as well. So you want those goals to match. You don't want the goals to be one thing in your GG130 item and either not exist in your plan of care and your goals or they don't match. Okay, so make sure that you're paying attention to that as well. For follow-up and discharge performance, uh, when you're doing this at a follow-up oasis, you're looking at the patient's functional status based on a functional assessment that occurs within that assessment time frame. So within the 48 hours, if it's a resumption of care, if it's a other follow-up, that's still within 48 hours and so on. The discharge performance is the time period under consideration that includes the last five days of care. As we learned in sessions two and one, with the expansion of the one clinician rule, they have included the last five days of care in the discharge performance, and that includes the date of the discharge visit plus the four preceding calendar days. We are to code the patient's functional status based on a functional assessment that occurs at or close to the time of discharge. Now let's look at how we would actually answer these. Um, code number six independent means the patient completes the activity by him or herself with no assistance from a helper. Number five is set up or clean up assistance. If the helper sets up or cleans up, the patient completes the activity after that. The helper would assist only prior to or following the activity, but not during the activity. For example, the patient might require assistance cutting up food or opening a container, or they might require setup of the hygiene items or assistive devices. For number four, supervision or touching assistance. If the helper provides verbal cues and or touching, steadying, and or contact guard assistance as the patient completes the activity. Assistance may be provided throughout the activity or intermittently. For example, the patient might require verbal cueing or coaxing or general supervision for safety to complete the activity. Or the patient might require only incidental help like contact guard assistance or steadying assistance during the activity. That would be a number four. 
Number three, partial moderate. That means the helper does less than half the effort. The helper might lift or hold or support the trunk or limbs, but they provide less than half the effort. For code number two, substantial maximal assistance, that means the helper does more than half of the effort and the helper lifts or holds trunk or limbs and provides more than half the effort. Code number one is dependent, that means the helper does all of the effort, patient does none of the effort to complete the activity, or the assistance of two or more helpers is required during part of the activity in order for the patient to complete that activity. Code number seven means we didn't attempt because the patient refused to complete the activity. Code number nine is not applicable because we didn't attempt it because the patient didn't perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And then a code number 10, not attempted due to environmental limitations. That means the patient didn't attempt this activity due to lack of equipment or weather or something going on in the home like hoarding. Uh, those would be coded as a number 10. Code number 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. That means the activity was not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. Patient gets too short of breath or their balance is so poor we can't walk or they can't transfer. Whatever's going on there, it's medical or there's a safety concern, that would be an 88. And then a dash is also a valid response here, but we know that CMS expects the dash used to be a rare occurrence, and that's used when we couldn't gather the information during the assessment time frame period because the patient might have died or moved out of the area and so on. All right, so now let's look at the different rows and what we're going to be assessing and get some guidance on what CMS tells us about those particular activities. GG130A is eating. And it tells us if the patient uses a gastrostomy tube, like a G-tube, or TPN, then assistance with tube feedings or TPN is not considered when we're coding 130A. If the patient does not eat or drink by mouth and they rely solely on nutrition and liquids through tube feedings or TPN due to a new recent onset medical condition, then we would code GG130A as 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. If the patient does not eat or drink by mouth at the time of the assessment and they didn't eat or drink prior to this current illness, then we would code GG130A as 9, not applicable. If the patient eats and drinks by mouth and relies partially on obtaining nutrition and liquids via tube feedings or TPN, then we code eating based on the amount of assistance the patient requires to eat and drink by mouth. All right, moving to the second row, GG130B, this is oral hygiene. If the patient does not perform oral hygiene during the home visit, determine the patient's abilities based on the patient's performance of similar activities during the assessment or on patient and or caregiver report. So what they're telling is you don't have to have them take their dentures out and wash them while you're there, but that you would need to assess them doing something similar or ask the patient and or the caregiver how they handle that. All right, so let's do some practice scenarios with what we've learned so far. Mrs. H does not have any food consistency restrictions, but often she needs to swallow two or three times so that the food clears her throat due to difficulty with pharyngeal peristalsis. She requires verbal cues to use the compensatory strategy of extra swallows to clear the food. How do you code GG130A? GG130A eating would be coded for supervision or touching assistance, because Mrs. H swallows all types of food consistencies and requires verbal cueing or supervision from the helper, code based on assistance from the helper. The coding is not based on whether the patient had restrictions related to food consistency or not. Okay, let's look at another. Mrs. V has difficulty seeing on her left side since her stroke. During meals, a helper must remind her to scan the entire plate to ensure that she's seen all the food. How would you code GG130A for Mrs. V? For GG130A eating, we would code a 4, supervision or touching assistance, because the helper provides verbal cueing assistance as Mrs. V completes the activity of eating. Supervision, such as reminders, may be provided throughout the activity or only intermittently. Let's look at another scenario. Mr. R is unable to eat or drink by mouth since he had a stroke a week ago. He receives nutrition and hydration through a G-tube, 
which is administered by a helper. How would you code GG130A for Mr. R? GG130A eating would be 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. The patient does not eat or drink by mouth at this time due to a recent onset medical condition, which was that recent stroke, and this item includes eating and drinking by mouth only. And certainly, we wouldn't want to put the patient in jeopardy having them try something that medically would not be good for them, right? Okay, let's try another. We're looking at B, oral hygiene this time. The helper provides steadying assistance to Mr. S as he walks to the bathroom. The helper applies toothpaste onto Mr. S's toothbrush. Mr. S then brushes his teeth at the sink in the bathroom without physical assistance or supervision. Once Mr. S is done brushing his teeth and washing his hands and face, the helper returns and provides steadying assistance as he walks back to his bed. How would you code GG130B? GG130B oral hygiene would be coded to 5, setup or cleanup assistance. The helper provides setup assistance like putting toothpaste on the toothbrush before Mr. S brushes his teeth. You don't consider assistance provided to get to or from the bathroom to score your oral hygiene item. Mrs. J cannot swallow any food or liquids secondary to ALS. She has a J tube and she's been on tube feedings for several years. She's being admitted to skilled home health care for treatment of a sacral pressure injury and her treatment includes TPN to support wound healing. How would you score and there's actually a typo here, by the way. How would you code or score GG130A1 and 130A2 at start and or resumption? The answer here, you would code GG130A1 eating at start of care as 9, not applicable, and at discharge, the eating goal would be a 9, not applicable because Mr. J does not eat or drink by mouth at the time of the assessment and did not eat or drink by mouth prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And Mr. J is not expected to eat or drink by discharge. Okay, let's do another. Mr. B has been prescribed bowel rest for pancreatitis, and he is not to eat or drink anything for a week after which the home health nurse will support advancing back to a regular diet. TPN has been prescribed, and he's being admitted to home care for TPN teaching and management. How would you code GG130A1 at start or resumption? GG130A1 eating at start of care would be coded in 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. During start of care, resumption of care functional assessment, Mr. M states he prefers to bathe himself rather than depending on helpers or his wife to perform this activity. The clinician assesses Mr. M's start of care, resumption of care performance for shower, bathe self, and determines the helper performs more than half the effort. The assessing clinician, using professional judgment, available information, and collaboration as allowed, anticipates that by discharge, Mr. M will require a helper for less than half of the activity for shower, bathe, self. How would you code GG130E1 start of care performance and E2 discharge goal? GG130E1 shower, bathe, self at start of care would be coded a number two, substantial or maximal assistance and then GG130E2, shower, bathe, self at discharge goal, would be coded as 3, partial, moderate assistance. That's because at start of care, Mr. M participates in the activity, but a helper performs more than half the definition of substantial or maximal assistance. The assessing clinician expects that he has the potential to improve in performance of this activity to the extent that a helper needs to assist for less than half of the activity which is the definition for partial or moderate assistance. Okay, let's do another scenario. 
During the start of care resumption of care assessment, Mrs. E states that she prefers to participate in her oral hygiene twice a day. On assessment, the clinician identifies that Mrs. E's caregiver completes more than half of this activity. Mrs. E has severe arthritis, Parkinson's disease, diabetic neuropathy, and renal failure. These conditions result in multiple impairments including limited endurance, weak hand grasp, slow movements, and tremors. The assessing clinician, using professional judgment, all available information, and collaboration as allowed, determines that Mrs. E is not expected to progress to a higher level of functioning during the episode of care. However, the clinician anticipates that Mrs. E will be able to maintain her start of care, resumption of care performance level. The clinician discusses functional goals with Mrs. E and they agree maintaining functioning is a reasonable goal. How would you code GG130B1 and B2? GG130B1 oral hygiene at start of care would be coded a 2, substantial maximal assistance. And then column B2, oral hygiene discharge goal, would be a 2, substantial maximal assistance. That's because performance assessment revealed Mrs. E's caregiver completes more than half the activity for oral hygiene, which matches code number 2, substantial maximal assistance. Mrs. E's condition in this example makes it unlikely that her performance of the activity will improve, but that maintenance of her current level of function is possible, so the discharge goal is coded the same as the admission performance. All right, let's do a couple more. Mrs. T has a progressive neurological illness that affects her strength, coordination, and endurance. Mrs. T prefers to use the bedside commode for as long as possible rather than using incontinence undergarments. The helper currently supports Mrs. T while she's standing so that Mrs. T can pull down her underwear before sitting on the bedside commode. When Mrs. T has finished voiding, she wipes her perineal area. Mrs. T then requires the helper to support her trunk while Mrs. T pulls up her underwear. The assessing clinician, using professional judgment, all available information and collaboration as allowed, anticipates that Mrs. T will weaken further by discharge, and while she will still be able to use the bedside commode, she will need the helper to assist with all toileting hygiene. How would you code GG130C1 and C2 toileting hygiene? GG130C1, toileting hygiene, start of care, resumption of care performance would be a 3, partial, moderate assistance. But GG130C2, toileting discharge goal, would be a 2, substantial or maximal assistance. The assessment at start of care, performance of toileting hygiene, demonstrated that the helper provided less than half of the effort for her current toileting hygiene. However, the assessing clinician expects that by discharge, Mrs. T will need the helper to assist with more than half of the effort of toileting hygiene. By the way, just a side note, when you're looking at your discharge goal, keep in mind the time period that you're going to be in the home. If you only have orders for 30 days, you're looking at what this patient's going to be able to do within that 30-day period. If you think you're going to keep them on for maybe two cert periods, you're looking at what the patient might be able to do by the end of that second cert period. All right, let's do another scenario. Mrs. D has been unable to eat or drink by mouth for several weeks due to a large cancerous lesion on the soft palate. A week ago, the lesion worsened, becoming very painful and required surgical removal. At the start of care, she remains restricted from any oral intake with the expected goal of progressing to small sips of water and soft foods by mouth with supervision by discharge from home health. So how would you code GG130A1 and A2 eating for start of care and discharge? For this answer, GG130A1 eating start of care performance would be 9, not applicable. But GG130A2 discharge goal would be 4, supervision or touching. Mrs. D does not eat or drink by mouth at the time of the start of care assessment and she didn't eat or drink by mouth prior to the current illness, injury, or exacerbation, and that's that recent worsening necessitating surgery. 
the assessing clinician expects that by discharge, she's going to be able to manage at least some food and drink by mouth with supervision. Now that we've gone over some of the new OASIS items in GG 100, 110, and 130, and went through some practice scenarios, we will see in the next webinar series, we're going to go over the item-specific guidance for GG 170 Mobility, which is a long item. And then we'll also look at J1800 and J1900, the falls items that are new to us. In the meantime, should you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, my name is Jennifer Gibson Osborne. I just added that last part, so that may be new for you, but I am the same presenter that you've listened to for years. And you can reach me at jgibson at access.com, or you can call or text me on my cell number that's listed here as well. We appreciate you using us for your educational needs and trusting us, and certainly am glad that you joined me for this presentation, and we hope that you'll use the other parts in this Oasis D Accuracy series, the last of which will be part four that we're going to cover next. So have a wonderful day, and we hope to join you soon. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access. Empowering care anytime, anywhere.